Time for question period, and I recognize the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you, kindly Speaker. <laughs> speaker, my first uh, question is to the acting premier. It's been over 20 years since the last Conservative government announced their plans to mess with home care and introduce competition and more privatization, and we're still living with the results today. Private sector providers making healthy profits, while personal support workers make little more than minimum wage and are leaving the field in droves yeah. for more job security. While wait times for home care services can stretch for years and years. What patients heard yesterday was the same Conservative government using the same language that they heard before. Why would they believe anything would change? The Deputy Premier. Well, I, I thank the a member for the question, but the reason why we have introduced the Connecting People to Home and Community Care Act is to make sure that people receive the care that they expect and deserve. Right now, there is a disconnect between our primary care system and our home and community care system. We want to bring it together so that when people who are being discharged from hospital but require home care leave the hospital, they will know who is providing the home care, what home care is being provided, and when it's going to be provided. That doesn't always happen now, and people end up back in hospital with complications. We want to make sure that when people are discharged from hospital, they have the home and community care supports that they need to get well. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, patients are still living with, living with the broken home care system created by the Harris Conservatives and kept in place by the Liberals. And the results speak for themselves, Speaker. One study showed nearly 80 per cent of personal support workers were unhappy with the job. And yesterday's patient ombudsman report said this, and I quote, patients and caregivers often reported that they had no notice that services would not be available on a given day, and they were left on their own to put contingency plans in place. End quote. Like the Liberals before them, the Ford government says it will deal with the chronic shortage of personal support workers. When will patients actually see a change? Minister. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the uh, personal support workers are an important part of home and community care, but there's a much bigger picture here. However, let me just read a quote from Miranda Ferrier, the president of Ontario Personal Support Workers Association. The proposed changes announced for home and community care in Ontario will provide personal support workers, patients and clients a new opportunity to work together to make Ontario health teams a success. Streamlining and modernizing the scheduling and funding process will offer Ontarians greater access to supports while also promoting continuity of care. The association hopes that these changes will work to stabilize and modernize the PSW profession. We know that it will. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, hope springs eternal when it comes to the way Conservatives deal with our health care system. I have to say uh, that uh, the, what the minister isn't recognizing is that uh, it's the frontline workers that make all of the difference, and in this home care system, that's the PSWs. Last October, I asked the Premier about Maria Konaspeskis, an Ottawa resident who's been living, literally living in the hospital since 2017 because the personal support workers and home care that she needs aren't available to her. She's still in that hospital. She is still waiting. She's one of many Ontarians who've been let down by a broken home care system that the Liberals had in place and that remains in place. No one is fooled by the government's plans for more for-profit operators and a new mega-bureaucracy. The simple question is this. When will patients like Maria get the support that they need? Deputy Premier. I would say to the member that should this uh, legislation that's been introduced in this chamber yesterday pass, people will see immediate improvement in the supports that they will receive. Because we are working on a number of fronts, the uh, member has indicated, the leader of the official opposition has indicated that personal support workers are an issue that we need to deal with. We recognize that. We are looking at the health human resource strategy across the board. My colleague, the Minister of Personal Care, is looking at it in, in long-term care homes, we are looking at it in hospitals and home support. But let me just read you another quote with respect to one of the key players in this whole transition. It's Sue Vanderbant, the CEO of Home Care Ontario. Oh. Home Care Ontario welcomes the government's move to mo modernize home and community care. Today's changes will allow patients to better access the Response. right care at the right time and in the right place. 
These changes will make the system work more efficiently and ultimately will allow local health teams to better work together to keep people healthier. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, to the Acting Premier, but I can say if this government can't get license plates right, how are they going to get home care right? That's right. Yesterday, the Premier Warner. insisted that the real people backed his plan for education cuts and classroom conflict. Was the Premier briefed on the results of his own government's consultation on education? Oh. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, it is the voices of parents and students that has guided our government in this negotiation, and that is, Order. And that is precisely why, Speaker, we have confirmed that we will keep classes low in this province for students in Ontario. In fact, under our government and under the Premier's leadership, we are keeping classrooms the smallest in the nation for the earliest years. We are doing that because we are listening. What we've also heard loud and clear is that parents want us to stand strong to see more money in schools, not in entitlements, in benefits, in wages for educators, and that's exactly what we're going to do, Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, last year the Premier bragged that the Ford government consultations were the largest consultations in Ontario's history. Yeah. Yesterday, the result of that consultation went public. Among other things, the secret internal government report said there was, quote, virtually no support for larger class sizes. Whoa. How can this government claim that they're on the side of parents and teachers and students when they're literally doing exactly the opposite? of what they were told by parents and students and teachers. Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are on the side of parents and students by ensuring that the best educators are at the front of class. Mr. Speaker, this government is on the side of parents and students by suggesting that more money entering the system ought to go in schools and not ought to go, Speaker, in a higher benefit asked by the teachers' unions. And we respect our educators. We value what they do. We pay them well, but the priority of the government, listening, heeding the advice of parents and taxpayers in Ontario, is to put more money where it counts. That's in mental health, that's in STEM education, that's in math, that's in the priorities that people want. It's what we're going to deliver in this negotiation, Speaker. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier and the Minister can't have it both ways. While well, the Premier was standing here yesterday spinning tales about make believe people who want cuts in the classroom, he was sitting on a government report that showed exactly the opposite. No one believes him anymore. No one believes the Education Minister anymore. Will the government stop talking about their imaginary supporters, take the advice of parents, teachers and school boards, uh, the advice that was given them during the government's own consultations, cancel the cuts and get to work on actually making a deal that works for our classrooms and our kids? Minister. Well, Speaker, the deal that we seek is one that keeps kids in class, a good deal for students that puts their interests ahead of union interests, and that's what we believe is so important to advance in this negotiation. In this negotiation, we're going to keep classroom sizes low. We're going to, keep this, we're going to maintain, in writing, a full-day kindergarten. We're going to commit to invest 100 per cent investments in STEM, pardon me, in special education to help the most vulnerable kids in our schools. Speaker, this is a good plan for kids. What you can't have both ways, Speaker, is small classroom sizes or more investments in kids and heightened compensation. We choose, we choose not to raise taxes, to keep them low, and to invest the taxpayers' dollars where it matters, and that's the success of our students. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is actually to the Minister of Education on a similar topic. Uh, time after time in committees and here in this chamber, we've asked this government to table the results of that education consultation. And now we know why they did everything in their power to stop it from coming to light. The Premier knew Ontarians opposed his plan. Before making a name for herself in the license plate business, the former education minister knew as well. And the the current minister knows it too. People do not want more children jammed in fewer classrooms with less supports. Will the minister finally admit that this plan has nothing to do with modernizing education and everything to do with saving money on the backs of the next generation of students? Minister of Education. 
Well, Speaker, it is this government that is investing more in public education. That's why we believe, Speaker, in the defence of education. But we also believe in getting more out of the system. We also believe, Speaker, that more money should be flowing in schools. In this negotiation, let me just confirm what we're fighting for with precision. We're committed to keeping classroom sizes low for elementary and high school students in this province. In fact, the smallest classroom size in the Federation for the earliest years. We're committing 100 per cent investment in special education to support those that ne with needs in our schools. But we're also committed to maintaining our position on a fair 1 per cent increase in benefits and wages for our workers. We think that is in the public interest to put more money where it counts in the success of our students, and that is precisely what we're doing in this negotiation. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the only folks in this province benefiting from this government's plan to cut classrooms are the private school companies with ratios of 14 to 1. Yes. As, as the details of this top-secret, apparently, consultation report came out, we are hearing even more voices who told the government not to do this. School boards, the Black Educators Association, directors of education, superintendents, the list goes on. They made it clear that increasing class sizes were gonna, was going to hurt our kids. Submission after submission said this would negatively affect courses available, increase safety issues, limit achievement, and limit career pathways for our students. Will the minister finally stop using our children as pawns in this bargaining game and Order. reverse his cuts to education? Stop the clock. Government side has to come to order. Restart the clock. Minister of Education to reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we went to the negotiating table on Monday to get a deal. We tabled what I believe to be positive proposals for students, keeping classroom sizes low, 100% investment in special education, and more importantly, Speaker, a commitment in writing to maintain full-day kindergarten. We also asserted that we will maintain the line on a 1% increase in wages and benefits. And what the response was from the union is that Order. they want higher wages, and if we do not give in on higher benefits, rather. That they will continue to strike. That is unacceptable. Member for Davenport, come to order. We're going to hold the line in the defense Herman of side, more order. money in schools, in our students. That's what parents expect, Speaker. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. For months, we have seen news report from around the world about COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. This illness has been spread within Hubei province in China, and the other jurisdiction has been taking steps to protect their citizens. Here in Ontario, we learned a great deal from the SARS outbreak in 2003, which saw Toronto public health system put under significant strength. We have seen cross-relationship cooperation between all of our health authorities as Ontario and the rest of Canada prepare to respond to this outbreak. Can the minister tell us more about the Ontario approach to the COVID-19? Thank you. Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Don Valley North for your question, which I know is important to all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, our public health authorities have responded to COVID-19 with all of the hard work and professionalism that the people of Ontario have come to expect. When dealing with an illness like COVID-19, cooperation and transparency are key. Ontarians should continue to look to public health officials for updates as the situation evolves. We are working with the federal government to ensure that our public health care system will respond appropriately. I would like to thank all of our skilled health workers who have brought their considerable experience and professionalism to deal with this situation. We all owe them a big debt of gratitude. Protecting the health and well-being Response. of the people of Ontario has been and will always be our top priority. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you uh, to the Minister for update. I would also like to thank our health 
care provider for the excellent care they provide in our community each and every day. Ontario is approaching this situation by prioritizing transparency and open communications. I appreciate the regular update from the public health of officials providing accurate information to the public on this situation. Thanks to these updates, we know that there are many measures in place to help contain the virus. Can the minister speak to some of the other steps that have been taken to protect the public from COVID-19? Thank you. Minister of Health. Yes, thank you. Since learning of the virus, Ontario has responded to COVID-19 by monitoring hospitals for potential cases of the virus in individuals with a travel history from some of the affected areas. Public health units have quickly and effectively taken all necessary measures to investigate complete tests and prevent further spread of the virus. Emergency health services communication centres across Ontario have implemented enhanced screening protocols. The Ministry of Health has also met with hospitals, paramedics and public health units near Pearson International Airport to provide further information on federal border screening measures. We are also continuing to collaborate with the federal government and, of course, with the other provinces and territories. Our government will continue Response. to actively work with our health care partners to monitor for, detect and, if needed, contain any cases of COVID-19. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, Ontario families are still waiting for answers from the Ford government about the shadowy Vaughan Working Families Group and their advertisements attacking teachers. Global News Toronto reports that they have yet to receive a response to four simple questions put to the minister regarding recently appointed vice chair of the LCBO, Kinto Anabali. Mr. Anabali, we now know, received the invoice for these dark money ads. He also joined the minister on his junket to India last year. I'd like to give the minister a chance to answer these questions on the record. Speaker, did the minister or anyone in his office have any knowledge of Mr. Anabali's connection to the ad campaign and any role in its placement prior to it being reported in the media? Questions to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Ontario businesses engage in a rigorous, open and fair application process whenever we lead missions overseas. In fiscal 2018-19, nearly 800 small and medium-sized enterprises participated in our government-facilitated uh, business missions. Participating delegates are required to cover their own expenses, including flights, accommodation and delegate fees. I have not had any contact with Mr. Annabelle in regards to the education advertisements that appeared in newspapers earlier this month. And as my colleague, the Minister of Education, has stated, our government remains focused on keeping kids in the classroom. Supplementary question. Speaker, it is clear that the minister had a relationship with Mr. Anabali, and a strong one at that, because it's not every day that a newly appointed vice chair of the LCBO gets invited to travel the world on a trade mission. Speaker, did the minister have a relationship with Mr. Anabali Government while he's the mayor order. of North Bay or at any point <laughs> before this trip? And if so, was it disclosed to any member of cabinet before his appointment to the LCBO? Minister. Speaker, as I said in my previous answer, I have not spoken to Mr. Annabelle regarding the advertisements the member is referring to. As with any participating delegate on a business mission, all businesses are responsible for covering their own expenses, including flights, accommodations and delegate fees. But, Speaker, we're proud of the tangible events uh, that came out of our mission uh, to India. Uh, now that the, the member has mentioned it. VVDN Technologies announced they'll be opening a new facility in Kitchener-Waterloo, employing 200 engineering jobs. 
I'm surprised the member hasn't asked about the 200 new engineering jobs in Kitchener-Waterloo. VVDN Technologies is already located in Kitchener with their office, and they will be starting their hiring in the next couple of weeks. We also, Speaker, I could go on for hours about the success of the mission in India. We're very Response. proud of our record of job creation and leading the nation in job creation. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Deputy Premier. Today, I'm joined by representatives from children's mental health organizations. Speaker, our children and youth mental health care is in crisis. Over the last two years, we've seen a doubling of the wait list for child and youth mental health services in this province. We've seen rising suicide rates and an increase in avoidable hospital visits for mental health care. Our youth are benefiting from decreasing stigma and seeking care in a higher numbers for anxiety and depression. However, despite the Conservatives campaigning on matching federal mental health investments, they have not kept their word. Can the Deputy Premier explain why this promise to the youth of this province has not been kept? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, our government is delivering real action by investing a historic $3.8 billion over the next 10 years to build a comprehensive, integrated and connected mental health and addiction system, one that is evidence-based, data-driven and meets the needs of patients and their families. We're committed to building a system where services are easier to access, high quality and focused on better outcomes for everyone, including children, youth and their parents. And under the leadership of our Premier, our government has invested an additional $10 million annually in child and youth mental health core services funding in communities across the province, nearly $40 million targeting mental health supports for Ontario students, $6 million in intensive services for youth with addictions, including withdrawal management services and residential treatment, $3.5 million for early psychosis intervention services, $1 million for a new provincial eating disorders prevention and early intervention program. Spons? Mr. Speaker, our government is also providing $3.3 million over four years for a pilot to test an integrated youth services approach. Mr. Speaker, we are making Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his response. But, Speaker, the Children's Mental Health Ontario estimates that the investment that we're asking for today would pay for itself by saving thousands of dollars in avoidable hospital visits per year. So while this government is looking for savings on the backs of children and youth in this province, there is a real human cost to inaction. In the past 10 months, the University of Ottawa has seen five students die by suicide. Our kids can't wait two and a half years on a waiting list for services and for supports. Bibi, a student at the University of Ottawa, says, I am outraged with the way that mental health has been handled on campus. It's critical that institutions, especially government and universities, adopt meaningful Question. and effective mental health policies and provide adequate resources to those in need. So, Speaker, I'm asking this minister to commit today to flow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please take your seat. Please take your seat. The minister to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, today, as you all know, is uh, Pink Shirt Day, and it, the anti-bullying. Uh, 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 and it, it, it's an important thing that we recognize as members of the legislature, and that we support our students, our youth, because it is another issue that affects mental health as well. Bullying is something that's very serious and affects many, many people. Mr. Speaker. We inherited a system under the previous government that was plagued with issues, 
There are problems of accessing services. There is a fragmented system. There are barriers to accessing those services, whether you're a child, a youth, an adult, or a senior, for that matter. And what we're trying to do, Mr. Speaker, is look, and we've met with stakeholders, we've met with youth organizations, we've met with people with lived experience. And what we've done is we've worked diligently to create Response. and soon we'll be launching the mental health plan for the province. Mr. Speaker, we take the youth, the suicide rates very seriously, and we were working to create a Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Speaker, Ontario is the leading the way on small modular reactor development to create a more competitive business environment and a clean, reliable energy future. SMRs have the potential to generate clean, low-cost energy and drive job creation, economic growth and export opportunities. Can the Minister tell this House how he's promoting Ontario's existing nuclear supply chain and experienced nuclear operators to support SMR development and deployment. Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mining. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Whitney, part of the Durham Four, who not only wear the coolest sunglasses, throw the greatest parties, Mr. Speaker, but are big fans of the nuclear sector and this exciting next generation or chapter for the nuclear sector. And Ontario is going to lead the way, Mr. Speaker. Last December, the Premier led the charge with a memorandum of understanding. We were joined by the provinces of Saskatchewan and New Brunswick who have raw materials implicated in, the, in this development, who have technology implicated in this development. And already we're hearing from other provinces and ter uh, territories who see real science and real opportunity for Ontario to lead the charge for this exciting technology, Mr. Speaker. I'm heading up to Ottawa for the next couple of days to join people with the Canadian Nuclear Association Conference. We're going to be hosting panels, Mr. Speaker, and talking about the exciting opportunity that Ontario has to move small modular Response. reactors forward, lead the world, Mr. Speaker, and make safe for, uh, uh, clean energy for this province and across this country and around the world. Thank you. Question. Uh, thank you to the Minister for the answer, and I can see the importance in expanding our nuclear industry here in Ontario. Can the Minister explain the benefits of this small modular reactor agreement to our local industry? Minister. Thank the member for that question, Mr. Speaker. Let's, let's start with some important statistics or facts here, Mr. Speaker. First of all, uh, nuclear generation accounts for 62 per cent of our supply in this province, but only 45 per cent of its cost. Contrast that with wind and solar, a combined 9 per cent of our electricity generation, but over 25 per cent of its cost, Mr. Speaker. Turns out the answer isn't blown in the wind, Mr. Speaker. It's about investing in 76,000 people who are employed, Mr. Speaker, in the nuclear sector with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics backgrounds, Mr. Speaker. A high prevalence of women leading the charge in this exciting sector, Mr. Speaker. An opportunity for small modular reactors to be the solutions for off grid opportunities, Mr. Speaker, remote and isolated Response. communities and resource projects in Canada's remote parts, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is going to lead the way, and I'm so grateful that the Premier last December signed that memorandum of understanding so we have a clear path forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier threw away years of planning and hundreds of millions of public dollars when he suddenly cancelled the Hamilton LRT without warning. Hamilton chose an LRT as their transit priority. They want the Premier and the federal government to work together to find a solution. If there is a deal to be made with the federal government to fund the Hamilton LRT, will the Premier agree to resume the RFP process and get the LRT back on track? The Associate Minister of Transportation, GTA. Thank you very much to the member for the question. Our Premier, our government, this side of the House has been very clear that we remain committed to providing Hamilton with a billion dollars. We have formed a task force of very credible individuals who are working very diligently to uh, make recommendations to our government, which the Minister of Transportation and myself are very eager and excited to review. They have asked for a, a small extension to, uh, to lead into March, but we are very excited to look at the re recommendations, and our government has been very clear, $1 billion to the people of Hamilton. Here, here. 
supplementary question. Well, it is the case, Speaker, that the uh, Premier's appointed task force is running out of time for a recommendation, and he may just be faced with the choice uh, if they recommend what everyone already knows, which is that the investment that Hamilton needs and deserves and will see will come with an LRT. So he can continue in his current path, wasting hundreds of millions of dollars and scrapping years of planning for the Hamilton LRT, or he could work with the federal government to find a funding solution. Yesterday, the federal government said that they would be a willing funding partner if only the province would make a formal request. Will the minister make uh, a formal request for funding to the federal government to get the Hamilton LRT back on track? Minister. Thank you very much to the member, and I want to be perfectly clear, it was the chair of the task force that requested an extension, and of course, our Minister of Transportation accepted and approved that request. We know they are working very hard. Uh, we support them in our efforts. That being said, we have been very clear. We are committed a, million, a billion dollars to the people of Hamilton, but transportation, we've made it very clear on this side of the House that it is a top priority for this government. The previous Liberal administration ignored transportation infrastructure for 15 years. We have shown our commitment. We are investing $28.5 billion to build subways in the city of Toronto. We are helping Mississauga build the Huron Ontario line. We are supporting Ottawa build, build, building their LRT, and we will support the people of Hamilton. Thank you. The member for Simple Gray. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the, uh, the Minister of Health. Uh, Speaker, 18 other countries have negotiated a deal with Vertex in order to allow patients with cystic fibrosis to access life-saving medication. Indeed. Canada is the only industrialized country that lags behind. Ontario approved Kaleidico five years ago. People like Maddie Vanstone from my riding who received this medication are now thriving. In fact, Maddie hiked the Great Wall of China last year to increase awareness about the desperate need for these cystic fibrosis drugs. Maddie is proof that these medications work. And the only difference between her and other patients with cystic fibrosis is that they have a slightly different gene type and therefore require a slightly different medication to treat the disease. My constituents and many others here today want to know, will the minister make a firm commitment that she will sit down and negotiate a deal with the pharmaceutical firm Vertex for these life-saving drugs, save these patients all of the distress and despair they're going through, save the expense on the health care system, and do the right thing. Do it then. Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, and I know that this is something that has been a, a very important issue for you and for many of your constituents for a very long period of time. We take the struggles that cystic fibrosis patients and their families uh, deal with on a daily basis very seriously. And like everyone else in Ontario, we hope that these new medications provide the promised relief. But we recognize that access to new drug therapies is important, especially in less common diseases where there are significant health impacts and where there are limited treatment options. So we are in discussions with our health partners. We are in discussions with Vertex. We know that the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance has also been in discussions with Vertex, with the meeting having been held in January. This is something that all of us are actively working on. I know there are concerns with respect to timing, and I will deal with that in my supplementary answer. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the answer to that question. Uh, in November, as you know, I made this House aware of two brothers from my riding, Andre and Joshua Larock. Their parents are here today, aged seven and nine. They have cystic fibrosis. One brother has access to a, a gene-modulating drug made by Vertex uh, through a drug trial. The other brother does not. When the two brothers had a cold recently, the boy on the drug trial was able to shake the cold like a normal child would. The boy that wasn't on the drug trial, was sick for weeks. He coughed non-stop for hours and days at a time. He coughed up blood, lost significant weight. His lung function dropped by over 20 percent. Every time this seven-year-old gets a simple cold, he loses more lung function. He will eventually become resistant to antibiotics and require lengthy hospitalizations. And he could, and very much probably will, ultimately need a, drug tran a lung transplant without drugs like Kaleidical and Orcambi and other 
uh, gene modulating drugs. Question. Minister, I guess my constituents, because we've raised this, it goes back to 2014 when you and I chased around the former health minister under the Liberals on the same issue. Can you do everything in your power and with the Premier beside you to speed up these negotiations and get these life saving drugs to these people? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Minister, to reply. I, there are very significant health consequences here. We are certainly very well aware of that, and we are doing our best to move this forward. Part of the issue, as you will be aware, is that there's both provincial requirements that have to be completed and federal requirements in order for a drug to be approved, to be put on the formulary, and to be available to people. Uh, one of my roles is as co-chair of the uh, provincial, territorial, federal group. Uh, it is something that I intend to bring forward at our next meeting this spring to see if some of these approval processes can be run concurrently instead of consecutively to speed up the process. We know that there are certain levels of safety and effectiveness that we have to prove, but it shouldn't take years and years for this to be completed. I'm a, a very concerned about the timeframes as well. I do intend to bring this forward. With respect Response. to the specific drugs themselves, or Cambi, Simdeco, and Trikafta, or Cambi is approved in pediatric circumstances in exceptional cases. Simdeco is still going through, as I understand, the uh, CADETH. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. On this side of the House, we know that being open for business and open for jobs means being open for trade. As the MPP for riding that has an international border, free trade with the U.S. is a key concern to my constituents. If Ontario were a country, we would be the third largest trading partner of the U.S., with nearly $400 billion in two-way trade. Given the importance of this relationship to businesses in Stormont, Dundas, and South Bungary, would the minister please inform the House of what efforts are underway to ensure that NAFTA 2.0 is ratified by the federal government as quickly as possible? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we live in a globally competitive world, and our government knows that we must take a proactive approach to international trade. Throughout the negotiation of NAFTA 2.0, our government's top priority was to protect jobs for the hardworking people of Ontario, and our work continues. In our submission to the Federal Standing Committee on International Trade, we urged all federal parties to work together and ratify the agreement as quickly as possible. Speaker, we outlined that one in five jobs are U.S. trade-related. A successful NAFTA 2.0 agreement is the critical next step in providing certainty to businesses around the world. Speaker, that certainty will add to the over 300,000 new jobs already created here in the province of Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you to the Minister for that answer. And Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to hear the Minister is continuing to take a leadership role in ensuring the ratification of NAFTA 2.0. Today, nearly one in five jobs in Ontario depend on trade. So that's more than 1.3 million hardworking men and women whose jobs are supported by exports in our province. We are now the number one customer in 19 U.S. states and second for nine others and account for more than one half of the total merchandise trade between Canada and the U.S. I hope all members of this House, regardless of party, are able to appreciate the importance of NAFTA 2.0 to the stability of our economy. Can the minister please explain to the House in more detail how Ontario is continuing to pursue the increased trade with the U.S.? Minister. Earlier this month, Premier Ford led a trade mission to Washington and Dallas. We met with a number of U.S. governors and business leaders to build on our multi-billion dollar trade relationship. However, Speaker, we know we cannot take these uh, uh, relationships for granted, so we are focused on ensuring Ontario has the right tools to strengthen U.S. economic partnerships. As part of our new strategy, for U.S. trade, Ontario will now pursue a first-of-their-kind strategic investment and procurement agreements with key U.S. states. Speaker, these agreements will expand important economic relationships. They will ensure Ontario companies are on a level playing field for government procurement opportunities. 
As free traders, we have a fundamental obligation to ensure Ontario companies have the greatest market Response. access possible, and we will continue to push for free trade and fair trade with our U.S. partners. Member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, this government's half-baked plan for involuntary e-learning is just as unpopular among London North Centre parents as it is in the rest of the province of Ontario. The government needs to put on its listening ears. Mark is a father in my writing who says that having educators in class are essential for his son's learning because when his son, and I quote, reads something, he often has a difficult time understanding what's required. The fact remains, he does much better with more one-on-one -on -one instruction. Online courses would be horrendous for his learning style." End quote. Teachers who administer e-learning tell me that the student success rate for those who willingly take these courses is just over half. That's with dedication and consent. Why is this government so committed to making learning more difficult for Ontario students and life more difficult for families like Mark's? The Minister of Education will reply. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government is committed to providing more course offerings for students right across Ontario. And that's why we believe when we've seen a 144 per cent increase from 2012 in enrollment, when we see young people turning digitally, knowing that the future of jobs is online, the future of jobs is embracing the fluency required in the marketplace, we think providing more offerings, providing internet every school, providing exceptions for children who otherwise ought not be in that program, perhaps with those individualized learning plans, for example. This is a plan that works for all young people. It's a plan to ensure our kids are modern and are learning online, giving them the skills to succeed for the jobs of tomorrow. Speaker. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. The Minister, through you, Speaker, talks about more courses, but what he's really saying is fewer caring adults. Students don't need forced screen time. The minister needs to check his watch. E-learning is not 21st century learning. Collaboration, critical thinking, and problem solving are highly prized skills in our workforce and best delivered face-to-face -face by our excellent Ontario educators. Speaker, students learn best in classrooms with their friends, not alone with a computer. It's a superior learning environment and better for their mental health. Jen is a mother in my riding who works as a 911 dispatcher. She hears the struggles of teenagers with mental health and behavior issues every single day. Jen told me that e-learning is not the answer for students with mental health needs. She wrote, I know firsthand the isolation teenagers already face, Question. the struggles they have with mental health. Hiding them behind a computer will only make this worse. I don't want my daughter's future education to be jeopardized by these completely disturbing and unnecessary cuts to education. Will this government take the mental health of students seriously and cancel its online learning scheme? Thank you. <laughs> Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. This government is very committed to the mental health and strength of every young person in the province. As the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction said in this House, today we are all standing together as legislators to combat bullying in all of its forms. And that's why I was really proud to be at WE, the Education Centre, earlier today, virtually with young people uh, in uh, Peel Region, students in school, who are sharing their stories and lived experiences where I announced and we launched the survey, an anti-bullying survey to empower young people to have a voice and be part of the solution to combat this challenge that manifests not in one school but across this country. We're going to take this seriously. We're going to continue to invest, continue to listen, and ensure children are safe in schools in this country. Okay. Member for Brantford, Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Minister, constituents in my riding of Brantford Brant have told me that for too long they felt lost and unsupported by the previous government when it came to accessing mental health and addictions care in their communities. Speaker, I know that the minister has recently been traveling across the province to hear directly from those with lived experience and experts within the mental health and addiction sector about the changes they expect to see within the province's mental health and addiction system. I was proud to be able to host the minister for one of these engagement sessions in my writing, where we heard directly from community leaders and experts in the field on mental health and addictions care. Following the session, I heard from many participants who were pleased to see that our government is taking action to address mental health and addictions in the province. Minister, could you please update the members of this legislature about what you have heard 
during your travels across the province. Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the member for Bradford Brent for the excellent question and the great work that he's been doing and uh, for welcoming me into his community so that we can have a frank conversation about the needs of the community. Last year, Mr. Speaker, we began traveling across the province to hear directly from mental health and addiction system leaders, experts, community and municipal leaders, indigenous ex leaders, people with lived experience, first responders, and among many others that, we could, that are, were continually neglected under the, the previous government, the, the previous Liberal government. And since June of last year, Mr. Speaker, I've traveled across the province from large cities to remote flying communities to hear directly from those who have been struggling to navigate a complex and confusing system caused by the neglect of the previous government. The reality is that our mental health and addiction system has been challenged by extensive wait times, barriers to access, inconsistent quality of care, and a lack of standardized data. Mr. Speaker, that's why we've continued to make Bonds. mental health and addictions a priority. Ontarians across all stages of life need and deserve quality mental health and addictions care, and our government will deliver that care. Supplementary question. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his response, and I am thrilled to hear that our government is continuing to listen to the many Ontarians who struggle with mental health and addictions challenges across the province. It is clear that our government is engaging directly with system leaders, individuals with lived experience, among many others who will directly inform our government's plans for this system. I know that the residents of my riding of Brantford Brant are looking forward to hearing more about our government's plans for mental health and addictions in the province. Speaker, could the minister please explain to the members of this legislature what Ontarians can expect to see in our plan for mental health and addictions in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government is very much looking forward to sharing more about our plans for mental health and addictions in the province of Ontario. Since the start of our mandate, our government held extensive consultations spanning the entire province. We recognize that our unique considerations related to the provision of mental health and addictions in communities across Ontario, and they need to be taken into account in our strategy. And that's why, together with the, the Ministry of Health's work on mental health and addictions, it's being conducted in a way that it brings all partner ministries together. So we are working with children, community and social services, municipal affairs and housing, among others. Mental health affects all of us, Mr. Speaker, whether it's our children or our seniors. We will continue to make mental health and addictions a priority Response. for our government and look forward to delivering real and meaningful change to the system, not just for us, but for our children and the many generations to come. The government side will come to order. Start the clock. Once again, I apologize to the member for Hamilton East Stone Creek, who is the floor. I'd like to uh, thank the government side for the reception. I'm not even one of the all stars over there. Uh, 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 my question is to the Premier. This government order. wants to pretend that everyday Ontarians support their plan to make life worse for students and teachers but they can't show us the receipts from anyone who agrees with them. So let's hear from another parent who, unlike the Conservatives, is fighting for what matters, a good education for the kids. Heather, a mum in Hamilton East Stony Creek, reached out to me to say that, thanks to the Conservative course cancellations, her grade 12 daughter almost didn't have enough classes to graduate this year. Heather supports teachers because supporting teachers means supporting students. Why doesn't the government? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to hear a story from Melissa, who wrote into one of my caucus colleagues. 
And this is what she said. She's a parent with three school-age children who is struggling and growing weary of the union job action. Her message was clear. She's taking more days off. Her husband has no more vacation days to take. And the impact on her family of this escalation is real. It's impacting so many young people and their parents in this province. And her message Order. was that she thinks the time has come to put an end to this. The parents are in dire straits, that they need help, and the continued pressures Order. of juggling childcare is not helping anyone. She believes that teachers are well compensated, and, Speaker, she wants them to stay at the table to get a deal. We agree. Our aim in this negotiation is to fight for Melissa, every child and parent in this province, so that their children remain in class. Uh -huh. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Heather, Heather is also concerned about the Conservative plan to force kids out of the classroom and into mandatory online learning. She said that. If this plan, had been, this plan had been in place this year, her daughter might not have passed at all or graduated. She, in, in her career in high school, had failed two online courses, in her, and uh, that was an, an option that she didn't expect. Like many parents, Heather agrees that mandatory e-learning isn't just a bad idea, Mr. Speaker. It will be a devastating for students like her daughter. So again, to the Premier. Why does this government care so little about families like Heather that they're willing to put the futures of hundreds of thousands of kids in our province at stake? Minister. Well, Speaker, we want to ensure, and we're fighting hard, that Heather's child remains in class. That is the government's mission. It's what we're trying to do at the negotiating table. However, Speaker, it requires a willing partner. And as we hear from Miguel, Another individual taxpayer, citizen and parent shared their story through one of my caucus colleagues, and he believes that teachers are well compensated and they should not be striking because of, quote, higher benefits on the backs of taxpayers. He says that the government is offering a fair deal. He wants them to accept it. He wants their children in class, and he believes the teacher, too, wants to be back in class. And so the question, Speaker, is how can we work to ensure that they remain in class? It's by putting a fair deal on the table, which is what we did. Low classroom sizes, protecting full-day kindergarten, investing 100 percent, Speaker, Order. in special education and offering a fair 1 percent enhancement Spons. to wage and benefits. It's a good deal for students. It's about time the unions accept that. Yeah. The member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. On Monday, the Minister spoke to the Toronto Region Board of Trade, reiterating our commitment to being open for business while outlining the importance of Ontario's trade strategy. Ontario is leading the nation in job creation, with over 300,000 jobs created in Ontario since our government was elected in June 2018. This is a Made in Ontario success story and speaks to the tremendous efforts made by our government to create a business environment that enables Ontario to compete for jobs and investment in the global market. Mr. Speaker, can the minister update the legislature on how our plan is creating opportunities for businesses right here in Ontario? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, the member is correct. Over 300,000 new jobs have been created in Ontario. But to put a finer point on that, three quarters of all new jobs created in Canada were created right here in the province of Ontario. And this did not happen by accident. It's because we lowered the cost of doing business in Ontario by $5 billion last year, $5.4 billion this year. We've removed red tape, reduced the regulatory burden, and, Speaker, now we want to build on this momentum and maximize our trade advantage. To compete and win, Ontario will help businesses unlock new economic opportunities. We will focus on three trade areas interprovincial, right across Canada, Speaker, into the U.S. and all across the world. This new strategy is an exciting new chapter for Ontario as we continue to create the climate for job creation. The supplementary question. Thank you to the Minister for that answer. It is clear that making Ontario open for business and open for jobs is a top priority for our government. Because of the action taken by our government, Ontario has seen an increase in trade 
and investment. By creating the conditions necessary for businesses to succeed, our government is laying the foundation for a growing economy that will provide good jobs for Ontario workers. Results matter, Mr. Speaker, and our government is delivering for the people of Ontario. Back to the Minister, Mr. Speaker. Can he provide some context on how Ontario is faring in a globally competitive market? Minister. Speaker, Ontario is leading the nation in job creation. In fact, Ontario created, Ontario created more jobs than Michigan, New York, and California combined. When we meet with businesses and investors at home and abroad, they understand that Ontario is an island of stability in an uncertain geopolitical landscape. Since 2002, Ontario's worldwide market access has grown from five countries to 49 through new trade agreements around the world. Doing business in Ontario means businesses here have preferential access to over one and a half billion customers worldwide. So, Speaker, we will continue our efforts Response. to create the right conditions for growth and send a message to job creators around the world. Ontario is open for business, open for jobs, and open for— Thank you very much. The next question, the member from Mesquitaquot, James Bay. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On May 28, 2019, Port Albany First Nation Council declared a state of emergency in relation to a widespread pandemic caused by drug and alcohol that gravely affecting the community. Lives have been lost, families are torn apart, and children and elders are left to their own because of this pandemic. Speaker, having visited the community a few weeks ago, Fort Albany Chief confirmed that after nine months, nine months, the emergency is still ongoing. Speaker. Why does, it, why does this government refuse to listen to the people of Fort Albany and once and for all take action? Minister Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, we continue to work closely with First Nations leadership regionally and at the community level to ensure that economic prosperity, their fair share of economic prosperity, Mr. Speaker, which will solve many of the problems in these communities, is on this government's agenda, Mr. Speaker. My colleague, the Minister, Associate Minister responsible for Mental Health and Addictions, has done a great job of engaging with Indigenous communities, ensuring that they have a, a, a say in the design, Mr. Speaker, and the development of community-based uh, uh, support, Mr. Speaker. In fact, we've taken a whole-of-government approach. I've recently visited a couple of the isolated communities with the Minister of Child, Youth and Social Services, Mr. Speaker, and we saw great examples of how those communities are making fundamental changes, Mr. Speaker, and outcomes for young, uh, for young people. Mr. Speaker, we're interested in a future that for Indigenous Response. people that offers an economic prosperity, Mr. Speaker, and we're focused on the kinds of policy options that will create just that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, to this day, Fort Albany has received absolutely no help to manage this addiction emergency. Chief and Council want to open a mental health and detox centre to treat people near their loved ones and according to their traditions. My office has reached out to the Minister's office on multiple occasions to receive repeatedly the same answer. The federal government is leading the response to this emergency. <coughs> Speaker, why did this government continue playing jurisdictional ping-pong instead of standing up for the people of Fort Albany? First Nations in this ongoing and what in, go, in doing what is right. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that very important question. Mr. Speaker, our government takes the development of a mental health strategy very seriously. And we have done many consultations with numerous Indigenous communities around the province. What we're trying to do and what we will do is establish a connected system that will look after access and providing services when and where they are needed in the local communities. So, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work, and I would like to uh, hear a little bit more from the member opposite with respect to Fort Albany. We have met yesterday, for instance, with many of the chiefs from Ontario and many of the support workers around Indigenous communities, and we heard overwhelmingly 
the problems that exist. Now, these problems weren't created a year ago. These problems have existed for a long time Response. under previous governments. But rest assured, our government is doing everything it can and will do on, uh, from the standpoint of all of us working together with the. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My, my, question, my question is again for the Minister of Health. Yesterday, our government introduced the Connecting People to Home and Community Care Act. This bill introduced includes many changes that, if passed, would improve the coordination of home care services, making them more accessible for Ontarians who need them. Right now, there are patients who are well enough to leave the hospital but can't do so because they are unable to assess appropriate home care services. Fixing this problem is an essential part of ending whole health care. Can the minister tell this house how the act it passed would help solve those non-standing non issues for the home care sector? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. If passed, the Connecting People to Home and Community Care Act will solve many of the problems caused by the current outdated legislative framework. We intend to help our home and community care service providers respond to the needs of patients and families in communities around the entire province. This proposed legislation would remove restrictions on the model of delivery, including care coordination. This would support flexible home and community care that is connected with both acute hospital care and with primary care. As we debate this bill, we look forward to further discussions on how our changes can help more patients access home care and, of course, improve their quality of life. Thank you very much. The question period has concluded.